Hello everyone. Welcome back to the Typologetics YouTube channel. I'm Derek Barefoot, my wife May. Uh, we're in the middle of a study on patterns of inspiration in the Bible, and we're about to continue with that. Uh, let's open with prayer. Uh, Father, please equip us to do your will in uh, every respect and to be a witness to the truth that's in your Son alone. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now, we had st we've studied a couple of patterns. Uh, the first one was the pattern of what I call the exalted seventh instance. So uh, the days of creation, the seventh day is, is, is exalted. We saw other examples of that kind of pattern. And then it works out in the resurrections, uh, the, the actual resurrections in the Bible up to Jesus. There are six individual resurrections. Jesus is the seventh, his is to immortal life whereas the others are to mortal life. So that exalted seventh instance works out on a large scale with respect to the uh, resurrection. And we looked at the, uh, uh, what I call the pattern of uh, the martyrs. And that is that we have three martyrs among the prophets to Israel, those being Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, Uriah, the son of Shemaiah, and John the Baptist. Uh, then there are three prophets whose deaths are historically noted, not, not merely prophesied, but actually historically described or noted in the New Testament, those being Stephen of Jerusalem, uh, James, uh, the son of Zebedee, the brother of John, and finally Antipas of Pergamum in the book of Revelation. And it just so happens that in each of those three sets, that, uh, of course, in the center of which is the martyrdom of Jesus by crucifixion, that in each case of those three sets, among the Israelite prophets, among the uh, disciples who were martyred, uh, as, as described in the New Testament, the first one of each was stoned, the second one of each was killed with the sword, that, that phrase being used, actually, and the third one being beheaded. So uh, the likelihood of that uh, purely by chance would uh, be astronomically remote, <laughs> really. Um, but it, it has a certain cyclicality. We even saw that in the resurrection pattern. There's also a cycle that, uh, of concerning how long the person had been dead who was raised that repeats itself. We won't go through the, all that again. I wanted to, to just take a minute uh, and... Uh, address the matter of how appropriate it is to, uh, to look at these, to acknowledge them, to see in them uh, some kind of uh, inspired organization or providential ordering of events. And uh, to do that, before we go on to the next one, which we will soon, um, let's go to Jeremiah chapter 27. And I'll make a point from this that we see, um, well, you'll see how we might apply it to the two patterns that uh, we've studied so far. So Jeremiah uh, chapter 27, and uh, these are instructions that God gives to Jeremiah concerning his prophesying, concerning the message that he's going to deliver to Israel and to surrounding nations. So May, if you would be good enough to read for us in Jeremiah 27, uh, verses 2 uh, through, the, let's say, um, yeah, 2 through 8. Thus says the Lord to me, Make for yourself bands and yokes and put them on your neck, and send word to the king of Edom, to the king of Moab, to the king of the sons of Ammon, to the king of Tyre, and to the king of Sidon, by messengers who come to Jerusalem to Zedekiah, king of Judah. Command them to go to their masters, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, thus you shall say to your masters, I have made the earth, the men, and the beasts, which are on the face of the earth, by my great power, and by my outstretched arm and I will give it to the one who is pleasing in my sight. Now I give in all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant, and I have given him also the wild animals of the field to serve him. 
all the nations shall, shall serve him and his son and his grandson until the time of his own land comes. Then many nations and great kings will make him their servant. It will be that the nation of the kingdom which will not serve him, Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon, and which will not put its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, I will push, I will punish that nation with a sword, with famine, and with pestilence, declares the Lord, until I have destroyed it by his hand. Okay, so I don't know if you if you uh, got all of that, uh, but it he, he Jeremiah was commanded to to uh, create a yoke to go on his own neck, a yoke and the straps that would go with it, the bonds that would go with it, just like a yoke you would put on an ox or a donkey that would bear a burden. Now the yoke was a symbol of servitude of uh, slavery really, because of course the animal, the yoke is there so that the animal can be made to serve its human masters, you know, plowing or hauling, uh, pulling a wagon, whatever it is. And so the yoke, the yoke here is a symbol that God says it was his will for these nations listed, Israel among them, uh, to come under servitude to the king of Babylon and Israel because of their unfaithfulness to God, unfaithfulness to the covenant. God had decreed a period of punishment for them and uh, the way this came, this punishment came upon them in stages really. And the first one was just to be a vassal to the king of Babylon, not to rebel against him. And of course that would have some uh, it would be a burden for them to bear, but they would, uh, it would not be destruction for them unless they rebelled. And, you know, he, he notes here that if you rebel, well, I'm going to give him the power to destroy you, <laughs> basically. Or, and, and I will uh, visit punishments of other kind on those nations. So now here's my point. We know that Jeremiah actually wore this yoke around Jerusalem, because later a false prophet takes the yoke and breaks it. Jeremiah has to make another one out, out of straw, out of iron, actually, so it can't be broken. But it, Jeremiah wore this yoke as he proclaimed this message to come under the yoke, you know, metaphorically, come under the yoke of the king of Babylon. Don't rebel against him. Uh, just go ahead and, and put up with, you know, a certain amount of subjugation to Babylon. And here's my point. Jeremiah wouldn't really need to have a physical yoke on his neck to deliver this message. It's that the yoke, wearing the yoke, added emphasis to the message. It made a striking visual picture of the prophet. In other words, he was himself sort of picturing his message as he delivered it. Uh, with this this you know visual aid as it were and my and my point is this that that god often suits the medium of the message to the message itself or he makes the medium that is the means by which the message is being delivered he makes it match the message uh to reinforce it to to uh light it up so to speak uh, make it unmistakable uh you know just give it that emphasis and that stress. And that's really what we see in Revelation uh, with these patterns. We don't need, you don't need to see these to understand the uh, information. For example, that the disciples of Jesus would suffer persecution as the prophets of Israel had. You can understand that without seeing anything more about the interesting way that that they're actually reflected in the choice of who, who, whose uh, stories are told and, and you know what, what happens providentially in those. However, when you do, you see that the biblical materials are organized a bit to reinforce the message. So, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we noted last time concerning the pattern of the, mar uh, the martyrs that Jesus says directly, as the prophets of Israel were persecuted, uh, will be uh, were persecuted. Those whom I send, the apostles, disciples, the early missionaries and evangelists, they will likewise be uh, persecuted. And just that we find, as we look closely, we see that that message that uh, that that the persecution of one would later be sort of 
revisited or, or, or reprised in the, the persecution on the other group, we see that they, you know, the choice of these martyr stories is such to, to really light that up when you see it. Another thing that I uh, would say about the, and the, the same is true with the other pattern also in its own way, is that these are not, you know, what we are looking at is not some uh, deep, strange mathematical formula that you need a computer to decipher or, or uh, you know, or so, some brilliant mathematics because of some formula that's hidden deep in the words or something like that. You notice that the, you know, all we have to do is read the information and sort of just maybe examine it a little more closely than we have. That's all we have to do in order to see that. You know, what we've, it's, uh, it, it, if it's hidden, it's, it's hidden in plain sight, as the saying goes. It's not, you know, it's like, you know, uh, like I said, it's deep in some hidden coding that, you know, requires some genius or something to, to find. You know, they're just sitting there, just, oh, well, just notice this is <laughs> all you have to do. And then you see a certain level of, I think, inspired organization to it. And the point, again, is that in both the cases we've looked at, that organization stretches across documents, across periods, across human authors, across even you know different styles of writing. Uh, for example, uh, the style of writing in Revelation, where we read about the last uh, of the uh, Christian martyrs uh, who, whose martyrdom is actually noted. Um, the style of Revelation is quite a bit different from the style of the book of Acts, where we read about the, you know, the first two, uh, just as an example. Um, and uh, yeah, so th th that's what's making my point, that this is not something that's illogical in the context of the way God communicates. It's not something that, that we have to know, but it's something I think that is faith strengthening to notice. Uh, one uh, kind of comparison that I, I sometimes make is to archaeological discoveries. You know, if, uh, like for example, it was back in the, uh, I don't know, it was the late 1980s, early 90s, um, that uh, I, I forget the exact date, I need to refresh my memory on it, but that there was a discovery in Jerusalem of the Pool of Bethesda that we read about in the, in the Gospel of John, where the man was healed, he's next to the pool, a paralytic, and Jesus heals him. Well, that pool with its colonnaded structure was uncovered in Jerusalem, and it was a significant archeological find corresponding to the Gospel of John. Now, it's not like our faith would be hanging on such a discovery as that. You know, it's not like, you know, a person would suddenly say, oh, wow, that, you know, that now I have faith, you know, that all of John is accurate or, or something like that. Um, so it's not all important to faith in that way. Nevertheless, archeological uh, uh, discoveries, uh, more generally even, that tend to ground the biblical narrative in history, uh, they are not unimportant. In other words, because everything doesn't hang by one discovery or another of that kind, doesn't mean that they are not noteworthy and interesting and even important and even faith strengthening when they when they come about uh, they are so in other words you you have to kind of take a balanced approach to things of this kind and the same is true with discoveries about i think inspired organization within the scriptures it's it's something that is not necessary to faith but i think that it is well worth noting, and it can be an additional uh, uh, strengthener to faith, and uh, maybe a complementary uh, a bit of knowledge for uh, witnessing in the right circumstances, you know. <laughs> uh, so, with all that in mind, um, we're going to move on to a new pattern, and there are so many of these that w I won't try to go through all of them. We want to limit this, but we want to do, I'd like to do at least one more that may take two or three studies to do to make, my, um, to make the, the point about them that they exist. 
So this one is a little different in that it has to do with a sequence of uh, numbered events, persons, and so on that we, we find over and over again in the Bible. Sometimes it occurs in a way that you could, you could attribute it to simply a human author organizing his material. Just like in Genesis, the, day, the Genesis days to, you know, to raise the seventh day and to give it kind of an exalted status, uh, the way it works out in Genesis 1. Well, that doesn't ne wouldn't necessarily require inspiration to do that. It's one author who wrote it, you know, so he could have done it for th thematic reasons of his own. But again, there are instances where it occurs where no human could have organized it. And there are many of these. Uh, so here's the sequence I'm talking about. And the reason I suppose that I think it's important enough to, to take note of is that Jesus himself calls our attention to it. And I'll show you where. So this is in Mark, uh, chapter, uh, Gospel of Mark. So chapter eight. And uh, be before uh, we re you know, we're going to read uh, we're going to read verses uh, seventeen through twenty one. But before this, I would like to set the stage, and it's just going to take me a minute, and we'll get back May to having you read for us. Um, is that in all four of our Gospels, if you look at all four, there's only one miracle of Jesus that is miraculous sign uh, other than his, his own resurrection. There's only one miracle that is contained in all four Gospels. That's the feeding of the 5,000, you know, with the loaves and the fish. Of course, you, you recall that, I'm sure. Uh, even people who don't know much about the Bible sometimes have heard of that, that Jesus fed a crowd on just a few loaves and a few dried fish. Uh, well, that feeding of that crowd of 5,000, um, although it occurs in all four Gospels, there is a second feeding of 4,000 people that only occurs in two Gospels, uh, Matthew and in Mark. So, and, and that, you know, the, so the first feeding is in all of them. The second feeding only be, was only in the first and second Gospels. Um, and in the first feeding and in the second feeding, everyone was fed on this small or, original amount of food, bread and fish, and then there were even leftovers collected. So in other words, everyone had their fill with food left over. And in the uh, first instance, it's a certain number of baskets, containers of food. And uh, then likewise, in the, the, the feeding of the 4,000 is described in Matthew and Mark. Uh, again, there are leftovers. Um, and the second feeding, when we look at the Gospel of Mark, it occurs in chapter eight. And then after that feeding, as Jesus is, um, as Jesus is embarking on, in a boat to go across the lake, the Sea of Galilee, which is, is really a lake, it's called a sea uh, in, in some of the Gospels, um, he issues a warning about the, the leaven of the Pharisees and Herod, and presumably Herod's uh, followers. He says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. It's in Mark 8 and uh, verse 15. Um, and this results in, uh, as occurs several times in the Gospels, is that the disciples misunderstand this as being uh, very, uh, very literal. So, you know, what do you mean the leaven? And they conclude, um, we must have bought bread from the wrong people. Like in others, I don't want to eat bread if you've gotten it from the Pharisees or Herod, because it has 
this leaven in it, you know, <laughs> or, or it has a leavening that's inappropriate or something. Uh, the disciples misunderstand that literally. And, and of course, Jesus has to, uh, has to set them straight that he's, he's speaking spiritually. He's, he's speaking about the uh, teachings and presumably the attitudes that are taught by example <laughs> by Herod and the Pharisees that they should you know, not imitate, that they should not uh, uh, learn from, le learn the wrong lessons from them, okay? And so let's go ahead and pick this up in verses, uh, we'll start in verse 16, okay? May uh, 16, and we'll read down through 21 of Mark 8. They began to discuss with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, you do not hear? And you do not remember when I broke the five loaves for the five thousand? How many baskets full of broken pieces you pick up? They said to him, Twelve. When I broke the seven for the four, thousand how many large basket full of broken pieces did you pick up and they said to him seven and he was saying to them do you not yet understand okay now this is so like mark the book of mark is for good reason called the mystery gospel because he leaves a lot of things mysterious and in in mark it it never comes right out and explains exactly what Jesus is driving at. He just leaves the question hanging. Don't you understand now? After Jesus gives them a couple of clues. So what exactly is going on? Well, they, you know, earlier, if you look uh, at verse 14, we'll back up for a moment um, and may just read verse 14. <laughs> This is Excuse before me. the warning about leaven. Just look at this little note in verse 14. And they had forgotten to take bread and did not have more than one loaf in the boat with them. Okay, so they had very little. They had almost no bread. You know, they didn't have enough bread maybe to, to make a meal for all of them, obviously. If they, had, they only had one loaf. So you could say, you know, effectively they had no bread, not enough bread, something like that. Not enough bread for a meal. And in verse 16, as May read, they were discussing the fact that they had no bread. And then Jesus says, why are you, why are you doing this? Why are you talking about having no bread? Don't you remember what happened in the two feedings? You know, are, are you really, you're, you're, you're so dense, you're so dull in your understanding, you know, your, your eyes aren't seeing and so on. Um, that w we had lots of, of leftovers. Um, and, and he's saying to them, can't, can't you now understand? Well, now here's one way to read this. One way to read it is to just look at 16, and uh, verse 16, where it says, they began to discuss that they had no bread and think that their attention has turned to the fact that they had not made good preparations for this uh, crossing over the lake. That by the time they got to the other side, everyone's, they're all going to be hungry, but they didn't plan, so they didn't bring food. And uh, Jesus is telling them, it, why are you worrying about where we're going to get more bread? Yeah, haven't you seen that I can feed a whole crowd on just a small amount of bread? So wh why would you need to be Oh, why would you need to worry about that? You know, God, God will provide. Haven't you learned that lesson yet? You know, we, we had lots of leftovers, you know, even when we only had a small amount of bread. That would be a natural uh, kind of way to interpret uh, this if you were just starting with verse 16. But why are they actually discussing this? They're discussing it because of that warning I mentioned in verse 15. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. So it's Jesus' warning. It's not uh, uh, Jesus saying, you know, it, it's not him 
making some remark about how little bread they have, or it's this, it's the warning about the Pharisees and Herod and their leaven that gets them to saying, beginning to discuss that they have no bread. So here's the point. Jesus seemed to be telling them, as I mentioned, that they had gotten bread from the wrong people. Uh, you, you know, I don't want you buying bread from <laughs> the Pharisees. That's the way they, they interpret it, right? Okay, because that, that, then they might have the leaven, this, this leavened bread, apparently, that Jesus thought they might have gotten from the Pharisees. And they're saying, how can we have any leaven of the Pharisees? We don't even have any bread in the boat. So, you know, how can you be telling us that we, that we got bread in the wrong place? Because we don't really have any bread. Okay, we got one loaf over here, but that's that, that, not enough to count. See what I mean? So that's, you know, that in context, that's the focus. Why would you be complaining about where we have gotten our bread? Because we don't, we don't really have any bread. We couldn't have gotten bread from the wrong people, you know, literal bread. And so then Jesus' answer, what can he be getting at here? Notice that he specifically asks, as May read in verse 19, he asked them, when I broke the, the loaves for the 5,000, how many pieces did you pick up? How many baskets full? And they said to him, 12. In other words, he gets them to, to say the number of baskets of leftovers that they picked up, 12. And then, he says, and, and now with the 4,000, how many baskets did you pick up then? You know, the second feeding. And they say, seven. And he was saying to them, do you not yet understand? So in other words, he's saying, those numbers that I just got you to repeat to me, should give you a clue as to what I am talking about. The number 12 and the number 7 in the baskets of leftovers. Well, you know, if you don't have to be too much of a Bible reader to probably realize that both those numbers have spiritual significance. 12 is the number of Israel, obviously, tri tribes of Israel, and 7 is a number generally for, as we said, perfection, completeness, uh, 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 intensification, or universality. So that's why seven occurs, you know, so much is because it can indicate any any one of those things. Um, but it is a prominent symbolic number in the Bible, the seven, like the twelve. And if you would turn back to the first feeding, so that's back in Mark chapter 6. And notice the setting for that first feeding, or what is happening as it comes about. And that's in verse 34. And so, May, if you would read that, this is what leads up to the first uh, feeding of the crowds. When Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd, and he felt compassion for them because they were like, they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Okay, so he's teaching the crowd, and then what happens is the hour gets late, it will be hard for them to uh, uh, go and find food, and they're already, they've been uh, listening all day uh, to Jesus, or maybe all afternoon, whatever it is. The day's gone late, and it's gonna be a hardship on the crowd. So that's how the feeding comes. So then they, they're, all, they're all fed. Miraculously, the, 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 the bread and the fish are expanded to feed everyone. But what the kind of feeding that is most important is the spiritual feeding he's doing. He's feeding them on the word. You remember it goes back, you know, like in the temptations, which are Matthew and Luke, not in Mark, but during the temptations in the wilderness, Jesus said, uh, man lives not by bread alone, but by what? Every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. So these are words that Jesus, the Lord is delivering to the people. 
many things. He's feeding them much in the way of a better understanding of God's will. And then the physical food is really an incidental need that comes about. Jesus is not so much concerned. Uh, he, he, he has a concern for their physical need, but that's not his primary concern because that's not their primary need. Their primary need is for better instruction. That's where they're like sheep without a shepherd. They haven't really been taught uh, well by their teachers and leaders in the Jewish nation. And we know if we would go over to the Gospel of John and read about this, uh, Jesus says that. He says, well, you, you, you know, you ate the loaves later. He says that you ate the loaves and were satisfied. That's why you come back to me. He says, but work for the bread the, yeah, that, la that, that, that lasts. In other words, you know, give attention to your spiritual need first. Don't just be thinking about the physical needs that I fill for you. All right, These, this is going to give us the clue that, that when Jesus got the disciples to think about the spiritual numbers that came about as the baskets were collected in these two feedings, it's the spiritual nature of the numbers that, that points to the spiritual nature of the kind of feeding Jesus is concerned with and therefore that the leaven of the Pharisees has to do with the leavened teaching, sort of the sinful, infected, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, misleading teaching of the Pharisees and the followers of Herod. Um, it was to clue them in that he was speaking of spiritual food. Okay, that's it. Because they were spiritual numbers. And so next time, we're going to ferret out a little more about why those numbers made sense in context and then look at how these numbers recur and recur and recur uh, in, in ways that are actually perfectly sensible in reinforcing, again, major biblical themes, themes having to do with salvation history. So we'll get to that next time. Uh, we're done for now. Let's close with prayer. Uh, Father, continue to uh, feed us on your word of truth in the scriptures and the bread of life, your son, and guide us by your spirit till we're together again. Amen. Mm -hmm. And we'll hope to see you here next time.